In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Ave, hail. The greatest greeting ever given to a human. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that before this moment, and never since, does an angel ever greet a human with reverence. It's always the reverse. Men revere angels. They are higher than them in the order of nature. They are closer to God than men. They are more full of grace. There came a time when one would be found greater than the angels, closer to God, and filled with grace beyond measure. When the angel Gabriel greets Mary with hail, he's acknowledging the royalty of this virgin, descended from David's line. When he says, full of grace, St. Luke uses a word never found in human history and never again since to apply to a human creature. K karakatomene in Greek, gratia plena in Latin. This word singularly applies to the Blessed Virgin Mary. With this word, the angel is telling the Blessed Virgin that you are more full of grace than I or any of my kind together. And when he says, the Lord is with thee, again he's acknowledging, the Lord is with her in a way that he's not with him or anyone else. The angels dwell in heaven with God, but Mary is God's dwelling. The angels see God face to face, but Our Lady will momentarily bear him in her body and nourish him and give him her own flesh and blood. We see Mary was royalty when the angel greeted her. But certainly in Mary's response, her fiat, when she submits to the everything to the Lord, that everything the Lord wills for her, at that precise moment, the king of the universe, the eternal word, became flesh in her. A single cell yet containing all the Godhead's humanity and divinity. It it is at this moment she became the mother of God, and so mother of the king. In Pius XII's encyclical, Ad Celi Reginum, when he establishes this great feast of the queenship of Mary, the the patronal feast of our diocese, he stated, The royal dignity of Mary rests without doubt in her divine motherhood. And he goes on to cite the words of the angels, the angel in today's gospel, concerning the son whom Mary will conceive. He shall be called son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary is queen because she's mother of the king. If his reign never ends, her reign never ends. Tonight after Mass, during the veneration of the relic of the veil of Mary, we'll hear St. Hildegard's beautiful chant and the words she wrote, O Virgo, ac diadema, purpure regis, O branch and diadem, in royal purple clad, Mary indeed sits at the right hand of her son in royal garments, as Bathsheba sat at the right hand of of her son Solomon, whom when petitioned by his mother said, Make your request, my mother, for I I will not refuse you. Christ does the same for his mother, and so he cannot refuse her requests. Pius XII also said, that the Blessed Virgin Mary should be called Queen, not only because of her divine motherhood, but also because God willed her to have an exceptional role in the work of our eternal salvation. And how true it is. Mary reigns not only because she's the King's mother, but because she suffered with him. In the Alleluia verse for today, we hear, Blessed are you, O Virgin Mary, 
who stood beneath the cross of the Lord. Now with him you reign forever. It's clear from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, if only we, only we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And so Christ makes it clear. The moment he was betrayed, our Lord says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And this is true also of Our Lady. For the most glorious moment in human history was Our Lady standing at the cross, at the foot of the cross, in perfect virtue. And because of it, her greatest honor was her coronation as Queen of Heaven and Earth. No cross, no crown. Mary's crown in heaven has been earned at the price of the blood of her son, whom she freely offered and came with, with the piercing of her, heart, her own heart. She offered him at the Annunciation, since having been brought up in the temple and having no equal in knowledge of the sacred text, she knew that the, what the prophets foretold about the Messiah's suffering. And the moment she consented, saying, Be it done to me according to thy word, it is here she consented to be the mother of the one in whom the prophet Isaiah said would be led, would be led as a sheep to the slaughter. She offered him at his presentation in the temple when Simeon told her that a sword would pierce her soul. She offered him at Cana, interceding for the newlywed couple who had run out of wine, saying, Do whatever he tells you, knowing full well that a public miracle would inaugurate his public ministry and so hasten his passion. And finally, she offered him on the cross, the throne that he had to mount before mounting the throne of his ascension. Who can imagine the grief of this mother's immaculate heart? Just feet away from her son, whom she had always loved with a perfect love, who was disfigured beyond recognition. And because her love was perfect, her suffering was most intense. Tell what, to what shall I compare thee? Tell, to what should I liken thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? To what shall I equal thee, that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Zion? For great as the sea is thy destruction, says the prophet Jeremiah. The grief of Mary was so great that were it divided among all men, it would suffice to cause their immediate death, as St. Bernardine of Siena describes. According to St. Antoninus, while other mothers, ma martyrs, suffered by sacrificing their own lives, the Blessed Virgin suffered by sacrificing her son's life, a life that she loved far more than her own, and so that she not only suffered in her soul all that her son endured in his body, but moreover, the sight of her, own, her son's torments brought more grief to her heart than if she had endured them all in her own person. No cross, no crown. When we look at our own lives, how can we expect to be spared from suffering when the Queen of Heaven suffered more than anyone else after her son? But Mary had faith, faith unequaled. And pure love is realized in pure faith. And pure faith is realized in darkness as in, this, in the same way as strength is perfected in weakness. She submitted to everything, and her faith was rewarded. At the end of her life, we hear the words of Jesus to her in the Song of Songs. Arise, make haste, my love, my dove, my beautiful one, and come. For winter is now past, the rain is over and gone. When we look at our own lives, 
God decides how long the winters of our lives will be. But one thing is certain, they will certainly end. And we know God will res- reward his servants abundantly. For as St. Paul tells us, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Whether our lives be somewhat, some would call easy, or for others it may be hard, we can look at what St. Paul says. Forgetting those things that are behind and stretching forth myself, those things that are before, I press toward the goal, to the prize of the heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is somewhere in the heavenly courts a crown, a crown laid up for me, but the Lord, the just judge, will give it to me if I have fought a good fight. If we rely and cooperate with his grace, the Lord promises, to him that shall overcome will I sit with me in my throne. Our Lord continues, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Hold fast, that no man take thy crown. Earth is not our true homeland, and suffering is necessary to atone for sin, but it is also redemptive, as well as meritorious, when united to our Lord's passion and resurrection. All of us are called to suffer in some way. Mary was the inseparable companion of Jesus crucified, and she teaches us to submit to divine providence so that one day we may receive our crown as she did. Our consolation is that our mother is queen of heaven and earth, and she intercedes for us. Our enemies are the same as hers, and she has overcome them. But who are those enemies? Genesis 3.15 tells us, It's always been Our Lady and her seed, versus the devil and his seed. All of human history can be boiled down to that. The battle between the woman and the dragon. And the dragon was angry against the woman and went out to make war with the rest of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Such is the drama of life. This cosmic struggle, a struggle, a struggle where, no, where there are no onlookers. You are either on one side or the other. You either work for Satan or for the Queen of Heaven, whether you realize it or not. So let us suffer with her, and through her, suffer with Jesus, so as to reign with her whose heart is united to the sacred heart of the King. De Maria numquam satis, of Mary nothing suffices, nothing satisfies, nothing suffices, nothing. She is the glory of God, rather than the glory of herself. She paid the price, but look at what God has done for her. Who are you, O Immaculate Conception? asked St. Maximilian Kolbe. Another author has called her the vertex of love, humanity's response. For every action, there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. This is the law of physics. In the economy of salvation, the love of God had to be returned by humanity, but humanity being incapable, only one could be the tip of the spear of that returning love. She, by virtue of her immaculate conception, is our response to God. All of our love returns back to the Father through her as our vertex 
as our vertex of humanity's love. All of our faith is in and through and with her fiat, her yes to the angel. And that's why we greet Our Lady, Virgin and Queen, with this Ave over and over, so that our Mother, through whom every grace comes to us, will intercede for us to make sure none of her children are lost, but attain the glories of heaven. She is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Because without her, we cannot return to God, because she is our way to the Redeemer. The Redeemer never comes to us at all without her. No grace comes to, to us without her. We would all live a life destined for eternal fire, no matter what we did, no matter how much we suffered, if this queen wasn't conceived immaculate, was born and said yes and submitted to all, we would have no hope, no life, and certainly no sweetness. We would be miserable condemned creatures separated from our first cause and our final end. And that's why in the garden, God wastes no time in announcing her to the serpent. She is your downfall, he says to the serpent. And to us, he says, she is your hope. There will be one who will come. There will, there will be one who will come who will reverse Eve's curse. And she came, a queen, the queen. The curse of Ava has been reversed. Ave, hail to our queen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.